Dave and I are co-founders of Sandstorm, and one of the things that we actually enjoy quite a bit about our job is we get to travel around the world and talk to a lot of our investors face-to-face, -face, particularly institutional investors. Unfortunately, retail shareholders and smaller investors don't often get to meet with us face-to-face, -face, so we thought we would do this video and walk people through the typical presentation that we would give to an institutional investor. For those of you who are not familiar with Sandstorm and our business model, what we are is a gold royalty company. It's a very simple business model. What it means is we get a percentage of the revenue from mines around the world as those companies mine those mines. We have around 200 royalties around the world and we're getting checks in on a weekly basis that we are allowed to and able to return capital to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks and we'll talk more about that later in this presentation, but we've got significant amounts of cash flow coming from all over the world. One of the questions that we often get from institutional investors is, what is the reason that you would want to invest in Sandstorm? What are some of the key differentiators, not only from mining companies, but also from our competitors, because there are other streaming royalty companies out there. And so the key differentiators between us is that when you invest in Sandstorm, you're getting more growth than you get in any other streaming and royalty company in the world. Sandstorm has bought more streams and royalties that are coming on in the future than any other streaming and royalty company. We have more upside from exploration than any other streaming and royalty company in the world. In fact, if you invest in Sandstorm today, you're getting almost double the meters drilled for every dollar you invest than if you invested in any other streaming and royalty company. And at the same time, you get more value than you would investing in some of our competitors. The value that you get in Sandstorm is something we're gonna talk about throughout this presentation. And so that's, that's the theme of this presentation. It's the theme of why I invest in Sandstorm, is that there is more upside, there is more value, and there is more growth. As a management team, we've been doing these types of investments since 2005 perhaps more investments in this space than any other management team. And what we've really understood and known, what really creates value in this business model is that exploration upside. So for us, it's fundamental for every single deal that we do is to figure out how we're going to effectively capture that exploration upside. So as I already mentioned, one of the things that you get when you invest in Sandstorm is more growth. We've got about 60,000 attributable gold ounces delivered to Sandstorm, which we sold or will be selling this year in 2018. And based solely on the things that we have already purchased, we see that going up to 140,000 ounces per year by 2022 and 2023, once Hot Bottom's up and running. That's a huge amount of growth. We have a number of assets coming online, and that growth has been bought and paid for. We don't have to go out and acquire new streams and royalties to get that growth, and we're very excited about that growth. One of the key things that differentiates Sandstorm from, say, a mining company is that when we purchase an ounce and sell it, we get significant amounts of cash flow. Or if we get a check in the mail from one of our counterparties, that is free cash flow to us. It costs very little for us to actually run our business. And so the vast majority of the cash coming in is free cash flow. And you can see on this chart here, we have a variety of different assets. Each one of these different shades is cash flow coming from a different mine, a different partner, a different part of the world. By next year, we see cash flow up to close to $70 million a year US and growing, this is on an after-tax basis, growing to over $120 million by 2023. Again, based on assets and royalties that we have already purchased. And it is important to note that this is after tax. We've structured everything so the tax either flows through the jurisdiction that we're receiving the royalty from or through Canadian ones. We don't have any kind of offshore tax havens. For us, it, we try to be as uh, conservative as possible in terms of the growth profile that we've been able to demonstrate on this, on this slide. Uh, over the years, we've never had to revise downwards our guidance. We've always been more conservative than our partners have. And so far, we've been pretty good at really hitting these. We've never really overestimated the production. But there always are risks. However, we feel uh, the way to address those risks is to get more deals, get more diversification, get more cash flow from a variety of different assets. For us, that's key. 
when I think about risk to these cash flows, I think that candidly the risk is to the upside in the sense that right now all of the assets that are producing and assumed in these cash flow numbers are assets that are making good amounts of money. And we don't see any of those mines turning off of commodity prices come down a bit. What you don't see in these cash flow numbers are a huge number of royalties that are either development royalties or advanced expiration royalties that could come online at any time and could be built very quickly. And the cash flow that is not in these numbers would then come online and increase our cash flow. We have probably around 160 royalties that are not included in these cash flow numbers, a number of which could come online quickly. This slide is something that I'm particularly proud of. And what you can see in the top left-hand corner here is that we have had record production every single year for the last nine years. 2010 was a record, 11 was a record, 12 was a record, so on and so forth. We believe that 2018 is gonna be a record, 2019 should be a record, and we're getting ready to set future records even past that because we've continued to grow our portfolio. You can see here on the right side of this chart, this is the number of royalties that we've owned over the years. We started out with zero in 2009, and by 2010, Dave and I and team had managed to get five royalties and today we're up to close to 200 and climbing quickly and we're going to continue to grow that portfolio. One thing I would say though that's changed about the company is that in the early years, in, in 2009, 2010, 2011, just about every time we had to buy an asset, we had to go and issue equity because that was how we were paying for these assets. Today, as we've already talked about, we have substantial cash flow from operations. We'll talk more about it later, but we also have no debt and we have a completely undrawn $150 million revolving line of credit. And so we have vast resources with which we can go out and acquire new streams and new royalties without having to issue equity. And so our future growth, you're gonna continue to see these number of royalties go up, but it's gonna be without having to issue equity when we go and do those transactions. So here on this map, you can see the distribution of our assets around the world. So. Uh, for the most part, the Americas is where we've done the bulk of our investments. Uh, however, we are seeing smattering of investments around the world. I would expect, although we're not really directed to any particular jurisdictions, we tend to see most of our deals in North America, South America. So in the future, if you were to look five years from now, you'd probably see the same sort of uh, distribution of uh, projects. However, just more concentration in a number of different areas. So this is another uh, aspect that I don't think a lot of investors really, or people that have been following the Sandstorm story have realized. When we really emerged on the scene back in 2009, all of our partners were really junior partners. In 2010, we were getting 100% of our production from junior partners. However, over time and looking to today, because of smart acquisitions with good counterparties, because many of the assets were really upgraded in terms of the partners and the operators from juniors to mid caps or senior companies. We now have a, a counterparty risk that's much, much lower. 83% of our royalties and streams and the cash flow that comes from them is coming from either mid cap or senior companies. By the time Hot Medan gets up and going, uh, it's gonna be close to 90%. And that's really remarkable because that's actually as good or better than any of the other peers, public company peers that we have. What's even more impressive is the actual all-in sustaining costs that our partners will be producing gold equivalent ounces at. By the time Hot Medan gets up and going in 2022, we're expecting all-in sustaining costs of around $600 US per ounce for our partners, meaning that not only are we going to have great diversification of assets, we're going to have a very low counterparty risk, but our assets will be operating as some of, our partners will be operating as one of the lowest cost partners of amongst anybody in the royalty and streaming industry. So you've heard us reference this thing called Hotbodden. And for those of you who aren't very familiar with Sandstorm and our acquisitions over the last little while, Hotbodden is a project we're very excited about. We acquired our 30% profits interest a year ago and it's an asset that is going to help transform the company. It's a cornerstone asset. It's a, gonna be a low cost producer. It's being fast tracked into production. 
it's an important part of our growth and we're very, very excited about it. Yeah, so this project, Hodmedan, is located up in the northeast corner of Turkey, very close to the George border. Uh, it's in an area where there's a lot of uh, uh, hydroelectric uh, power being generated in Turkey. Uh, our partner on this asset, who owns 70% of it, uh, is a company called Lydia Made in Chilik. They're part of a much larger conglomerate group uh, called the Chalik Group, based out of uh, Turkey, that has a long history of working in construction, but also in mining. They have other Canadian partners, they've worked with other Canadian companies. Uh, and we're very confident about their ability to get this project up and going and operational over the next several years. This asset is comprised of a number of, of uh, claims that uh, where the Hot Madam project is located almost dead center in the middle of it. Great infrastructure. There's actually a power line that runs right over top of it. There's a very large highway just on the edge of the claims here to the, to the west. Uh, the project has really only been discovered and been valid since 2015 when the first drill holes were published on this project. Since then, it's gone through and started its uh, economic studies. It's currently completed its pre-feasibility and working into the DFS and figuring out how to get this project up and going. It's already started permitting. They've already started doing some of the early works in order to get, to get this project into that construction mode. Uh, I said the PFS has just come out. Uh, it has a very high grade reserve to it. It has over 9 million tons currently of grade of uh, close to 12 grams gold equivalent. Uh, it gets good recoveries on the copper, uh, I mean quite good recoveries on the gold. It has 11 year mine life with an average annual production of 260,000 ounces of gold equivalent per year. And again, this is a project that we have 30% profits interest in this asset. So once it gets into production, that's 80,000 ounces gold equivalent uh, that will be attributable to us. And that's at a project that really operates at some of the lowest all-in sustaining costs of any mine in the industry today. So based on the pre-feasibility study, we're expecting all-in sustaining costs of below $400 per ounce. So that's including, uh, that's including all the exploration work, the sustaining capex, ongoing capital that goes into that project. With the 11 year mine life, with that type of production profile that we're looking at, it currently has a 1.1 post-tax uh, MPV to it and a pre-tax MPV of $1.4 billion. Uh, over a 60% or 50% IRR, depending on which one of those scenarios that you look at, uh, and payback of 1.5 years in a post-tax scenario. We really do think that this is going to be one of the premier projects, not just in the Sandstorm portfolio, but in the entire mining industry over the next decade. One of the interesting things about this project and operating in Turkey is that, unlike most political jurisdictions right now, when commodity prices are doing okay, they're trying to increase taxes and find ways to get more income from mining companies. In Turkey, the government has not only a very stable tax regime, across the country, but for mining specifically. They're one of the few jurisdictions that has not only not changed or tried to increase taxes materially on mining companies, they actually offer incentives, which we believe we'll be able to take advantage of here, to encourage mining companies to build mining projects and give them even lower tax rates in the first number of years. So when we look at the payback period of this asset, we think it'll be closer to that 1.3 year payback period because not a lot of tax will be paid in the early years. So we wanted to put together a slide which really illustrated that low, low cost that we see Hot Madan operating at. And so what we've done here is we've really just looked at all in sustaining costs are of a number of very, very well-known mines throughout the world and just to show and demonstrate the economics, strong economics of uh, Hot Madan. So you even see projects like Fosterville, Kalini, and Malarnik, uh, and even large uh, companies like Muscle White uh, and Young Davidson. These projects all have a substantially higher all-in sustaining cost than the $374 per ounce co-product. 
And if you look at the byproduct costs, so using the copper really to pay for gold production, you're looking at an all-in sustaining byproduct cost of under $100 per ounce, making this really one of those remarkable assets. Another thing we're very pleased about with Hadmadan is the low capex that goes into this. So we're projecting from the PFS $272 million total capex. That's including all the studies that go all the way up to the commissioning of the assets. So including the cost for the mining, the milling, the infrastructure, and all the studies that are going to lead up, up into that construction phase for this as well too. That $272 million, that is expected to be financed right at the, uh, the subsidiary level that owns the mine. That's controlled by Lydium. They've discussed the idea of being able to finance with that with 65% in debt, which means that our portion of the equity works out to be under $30 million for us. So that's something that we can finance very, very easily. Uh, we're cash flowing by the time we get to 2020 or 2021 when the bulk of that capital is available we'll be cash flowing comfortably over 60 or 70 million dollars which means less than a half a year of cash flow needs to be used to pay for the entire construction of this asset from our equity portion of it. Going into the timeline, Lydia has told us they're still very comfortable with the timeline that we're projecting on this asset so far. It's completed the pre-feasibility study. Now we're doing optimization studies before leading into feasibility studies on the project. But also at the same time, Lydia is able to begin the permitting and the land acquisition process at this point, which we expect is going to be the longest part of the process. We still do believe that we'll be getting into the end of 2019 to begin the early works of construction. But the bulk of the work and the construction of this asset happening in 2021, it's a relatively simple mine. It's a relatively simple mill that's going into there. So we don't see any really uh, extra complications that could delay this from a technical basis. One of the things that I think investors don't quite understand with respect to this project is the permitting ability of the project. This is a project that is not only an underground mine, so you don't have to worry about any open pits. The mine is not using any cyanide or any deleterious elements from an environmental perspective. It'll be as clean as it comes, and we think it'll be a project that can fast track through the permitting process. This slide, I think, is one of the more important slides in the presentations. It's related to HODMOD and the sensitivity associated with it because when we first made the HODMOD an acquisition, one of the questions that we got from investors was, is this a change because it's not exactly like normal royalty? And because investors invest in us because they know that if operating costs go up or down at the mines, they're not materially disadvantaged when they invest in Sandstorm. It's one of the things that differentiates Sandstorm and royalty companies from investing in mining companies. And you can think about it if you invest in a mining company that costs $1,000 an ounce to produce a, an ounce of gold all in, and their costs of producing that ounce go up 20% or so, their margin goes to zero. And the investors tend to lose a lot of money when that happens. What this chart is illustrating, it's a 15% sensitivity. If the all-in sustaining costs at HODMOD and go up by 15%, the net asset value change is only 4%. The reason is that the costs here are so incredibly low, changes in those costs don't affect the cash flow in any material way. So we view this 30% profits interest very much like a royalty because it's not impacted by changes in operating costs very much, if any, at all. It's an incredible asset that I think it's very important for investors to understand the true quality of this asset. It's not just on the operating uh, costs either, it's also from the capex. So even if you see a significant capex overrun, it's the same sort of thing. It's demonstrating less than a 4% change if you see capex overrun by 15%. That's really the two biggest issues with mining companies today, is capex overruns, opex overruns, and this project, because the economics are so strong, because the grade is so high on the asset, because it's a relatively simple and, in the end, a small mine, 
it's going to be relatively almost insensitive to really those two uh, important impact costs that so negatively affect the rest of the mining industry. One of the questions that we often get is, do we plan on turning this into a stream or a royalty and converting the interest formally into that? Although we are very happy with the interest in its current state for the reasons that we've already discussed and gone through, it is something that we are looking at. We're actually working with tax advisors right now just to understand all the tax implications of what would happen if we did that. And we're going to continue to do that work. And we will be sitting down with Lydia Made in Chillick and having discussions and seeing how it goes. But we are happy with how it is right now. One of the themes that we talked about at the beginning was more upside. This is a very important thing to understand with respect to Sandstorm and our business strategy. One of the things we're trying to do more so than any other company is find projects that are underexplored, that have huge amounts of expiration upside so that when we acquire them, we not only get the cash flow that we thought we were going to get in the initial model, we get substantially more cash flow from all the expiration upside and that all of that additional cash flow from that expiration upside comes to us for free, for no additional cost. That's how we get our investors higher IRRs than our competitors do. And so you can see through this chart, that is coming to fruition. So in 2016, for example, Sandstorm purchased and sold 50,000 attributable ounces or re correspondingly received 50,000 ounces worth of cash flow from our royalties. During the same year, for no cost to us, our partners explored and found 84,000 ounces on those projects. So during the year, you not only started with a certain number of ounces and got $50 million of cash flow during that year, you ended the year with even more ounces on the books than you started with it just because of free expiration upside. And that's not even taking into account acquisitions that we made during the year, which increased our reserves and resources even more. The same thing happened in 2017. We had about 55,000 attributable ounces sold by Sandstorm, but attributable to Sandstorm, our partners found 79,000 new ounces, again, at no cost to Sandstorm or to Sandstorm shareholders. So what you're seeing is a continued pattern of our partners investing in exploration in their assets and Sandstorm shareholders benefiting for no additional cost. Another way we're really trying to illustrate the exploration upside that we're so effectively capturing in our projects and our investments is this slide. So this chart, what it's trying to demonstrate is the amount of drilling that we've seen and the meters of drilling that we've seen on our projects uh, since really we became a company. And you can see as we've gotten into 2015 and through 2017, we've seen some, a, a remarkable uptick in the amount of drilling. And I think that says to two things. First of all, we've gotten a lot of good deals on some very high priority projects. Uh, and we've been able to uh, really effectively find those projects that are going to warrant those uh, investment dollars in exploration. So another aspect of exploration upside that's important is really securing these large land packages. And that's something I think that we've been very effective uh, in doing as well too. Many of the prior deals and some of our peers have really found very constrained areas. But for us, it's all about size. So you take a look at these projects, Cerro Moro, almost 2,200 square kilometers, Hyundai, over almost 500 square kilometers, and Japan, 634 square kilometers. These are projects where we're getting payments and cash flow from these entire areas. So not only are they just working in very, very small parts of this, but we're getting all that upside that might have. One of the important parts of our business is the ability to grow. And as I mentioned before, I'm very excited that we're moving into a phase of the business development where we're able to grow with our organic resources in the sense that we have significant amounts of cash flow from operations coming in that are going to be building over time. We have an undrawn revolving line of credit that's $150 million. And so what this chart represents is the dark colors here in this chart are the cash as it's going to build in our bank accounts over time based on our current projections. And the dotted line which is $150 million above that cash, represents our undrawn revolving line of credit. So that top line effectively means that's the amount of cash that we can invest into new streams and royalties and or return it back to shareholders through dividends or share buybacks without having to raise any equity. In addition to that, 
We also have, as you can see here, $52 million worth of debt and equity investments in other mining companies that we're perpetually turning over. That allows us to make equity or debt investments while we're acquiring a stream with another company, and then eventually we will sell that equity or we will uh, be repaid that debt amount and we'll return that into the general cash pool and use it to acquire new streams and royalties in the future. So we're moving into a period of our corporate life where we can pay dividends, buy back shares, acquire more royalties and keep growing based on our current resources. One of the other things that we were talking about at the beginning of this presentation was the concept of when you invest in Sandstorm, you get more value. So what we've done here on this chart is shown an enterprise value divided by EBITDA analysis year by year, Sandstorm compared to our other peers in the royalty industry. For those of you who aren't familiar with what enterprise value is, it's effectively the market cap of the company or what we're worth adjusted for differences in debt and cash divided by EBITDA, which is effectively our cash flow. So what you're trying to figure out here is how many years worth of cash flow does it take to pay back the value of the company, if you will. And you can see over time, all the streaming and royalty companies have lines that are trending down, which means we all have growth built into our portfolios. The line that starts the lowest, Sandstorm, means you get the most value today compared to all the other royalty companies. But our line, most importantly, trends down faster than everyone else, and that's because we have, as we've discussed, more growth built into the company than any other royalty company out there. So that by the time 2023 rolls around, compared to some of our larger peers trading upwards of 15 to 20 times enterprise value to EBITDA, Sandstorm, based on our share price today, would be trading at five times. So that's incredible value. When you invest in Sandstorm, you not only get the significant growth, you also get the significant expiration upside, more expiration upside than any of these other companies out there for every dollar that you invest in Sandstorm, but you also get it for significant amounts of value. One of the things that we do believe, though, is that that value is not going to stay there for long. There are a number of catalysts that are happening at Sandstorm, and we think that over time our shareholders are going to be rewarded by re-rating. The first point here is that we've got, as Dave mentioned, a pipeline of deals. We plan on continuing to acquire royalties, and we plan on doing it without dilution. As I mentioned before, one of the things that we had to do early in the company's history was when we would announce a transaction, we would have to raise equity. We're no longer at that phase. We're able to do these transactions, all the things that we're looking at in our pipeline, we would be doing that without raising equity. And so we think that they will be very positive catalysts going forward. Next thing is really exploration news. Our partners are continually not just drilling, but coming up with updated resource and reserve statements as well. Uh, and also projects are really moving up that development ladder. They're going from exploration up to resource development, up to economic studies. So all of those things are really, because we have such a huge portfolio of assets, this constantly news that's really coming out, we try to update some of the more most uh, predominant news to the market through our own news releases, but uh, there's always things that are happening on Sandstorm assets. And as those assets move forward, we see new producing assets coming online. That means new amounts of record cash flow. As I mentioned, we think that 2018 is going to be a record year for us. We really do confidently believe that 2019 will be another record year and there's continued and significant growth beyond that. And as we continue to hit these metrics and these records, again, without dilution, we are going to be rewarded by that. I think shareholders have been very patient with us. They are excited about Sandstorm because we are a growth company. But as we mature our business, we not only want to be a growth company, but we want to ensure that our shareholders are rewarded by returning capital to them. And what that means is share buybacks. We are actively acting under a share buyback plan right now, but also it will mean dividends. And although we don't have anything official to announce right now, that's something that our board is actively discussing, and we know that it's just a matter of time until we are a dividend-paying company. And once we are a dividend-paying company, I believe that we'll continue to act under our share buyback plan. So we'll continue to have multiple ways of returning capital to shareholders. We've created this amazing, diversified growth cash flow engine 
and we want shareholders to be rewarded for it.